Hello, and welcome to the Minimalist Moms podcast. I'm Diane. I'm a mother of three living in Columbus, Ohio. I'm trying to make room in my life for what matters by getting rid of the clutter and living life with purpose. I hope you'll join me on the journey to think more and do with less. There's no way you can be intentional with just your wardrobe or your home. Once you see and experience how good your home and closet feel, you want every area of your life to feel that way. I wholeheartedly agree with this statement from author Christine Platt, also known in the minimalist community as the Afro Minimalist. Christine is actually my guest today, and we'll discuss her upcoming book, Authenticity Over Aesthetics, and how less is liberating in our lives. But before we get to the conversation, I wanted to encourage you to leave a rating and review if you haven't done so yet. Leaving a rating and review on iTunes is the best way you can continue to help this podcast succeed and grow. Thank you to everyone that has done so, so far, but I know that there are still a few of you holding out, and I would so appreciate it if you just took, I think it probably takes about 30 seconds, and gave the Minimalist Moms podcast a five-star rating if you're enjoying it. And lastly, before we get to the conversation with Christine, here's a quick word from one of the sponsors of today's episode. You've heard me talk about quality over quantity before, so my ears perk up when I discover a company that provides quality products. I was pleasantly surprised to discover OneQuince.com is a one-stop shop for curated luxury goods shipped direct from the world's best specialist factories. Quince focuses on essential products with low design costs, cashmere crews, super soft fleece pants, silk camis. You could create a simple capsule wardrobe without skimping on quality. Their brand is always equal or greater quality than the leading luxury brands at a much lower price thanks to the manufacturer-to-consumer model. It can be difficult to find a brand that prioritizes production standards, fair wages, safety, and sustainability. However, this is of utmost importance to Quince, which adds to the list of why I'm happy to have discovered this site. If you're looking for tops, hoodies, robes, outerwear, throws, Quince has tons of variety. Quince has totally transparent prices, up to 50 to 80% less than other brands. And if you're not completely satisfied with Quince, they will give you a full refund. Customer satisfaction is a top priority. Again, quality shouldn't be a luxury. Try Quince today. Get free shipping and 365-day free returns. Just go to onequince.com minimalist. Many of their collections sell out immediately, so go to onequince.com slash minimalist. That's O-N-E-Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash minimalist. Christine, thanks so much for joining me today on the Minimalist Mom podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Absolutely. I am looking forward to discussing your new book, The Afro Minimalist Guide to Living with Less. And I want to talk today, as we spoke before we got on this call, that less is liberation. So I want that to be the theme of our conversation today and just really what that means to you and how that has happened in your life, I guess, through minimalism. But before we get into all that, I'll allow you to introduce yourself to the listeners and we'll go from there. All right, great. So I am Christine Platt. I am a mama author. I work uh, as a managing director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University. Um, I just kind of do a whole lot of things, kind of consider myself a Renaissance woman. (laughs) Absolutely. And how old is your daughter? I can't remember. Oh my goodness. She is 17 and just went to prom and is headed off to college in the fall, which is just surreal to me. Yeah. I saw those pictures. That is really exciting. And I'm sure that (laughs) you're probably sad, but I love you recently wrote a post too on just how it is bittersweet, these different seasons that are coming to a close, but also the relationship that you've cultivated with her to this point. So I just really love that post that you shared. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know, all of it. So like I said, so much of life is just learning to love and let go. And it's time for me to, to let go in a, you know, in a sense to let her experience the world, you know, Mm -hmm. for herself. So it's bittersweet. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's talk minimalism. I want to know more about what prompted you to become a minimalist. And then I also want to know what prompted the idea of you calling yourself the Afro minimalist? I'll allow you to take the reins here and just describe a little bit more about that journey. Sure. So I started on my journey to minimalism just sort of after realizing um, I had resigned from my uh, last position in the in the private sector and just sort of was home, 
you know, for the first time <laughs> in a very long time and really had a chance to sort of look around and just see just how much stuff we had. I think, you know, when you're out of the home for the majority of the day, like you just don't really get a full, a full grasp of just how much stuff you own. And I was just like, gosh, we have so much stuff and we have so much house that we're not using. So that just kind of prompted my journey. And then the way that I became the Afro minimalist is sort of realizing that mainstream minimalism really did not work for me, right? It was, you know, just a very barren and I thought very sterile aesthetic that I had tried to mirror. And I was like, I need to infuse some of those things that are important to me. Um, I'm a historian by trade and, you know, the history and beauty of the African diaspora are really important to me. So I wanted to be able to incorporate some of those elements into my home. And I just ended up calling it Afro-minimalism and gave myself the moniker Afro-minimalist. And, you know, just sharing my journey online and I just came across so many other minimalists who were like, my goodness, same for me. I love color. I love patterns. I love texture. Right. And then just also mm -hmm. showing people that there wasn't just one way that minimalism should look or could look. Right. And so, yeah. And then it became sort of like a, a movement. <laughs> And now here I am. I just wrote my first book, The Afro Minimalist Guide to Living with Less, that just really teaches people, you know, how to do the process of self discovery to uncover the root causes of their consumption, you know, understand attachment and why it's so hard to let go, you know, and just learning more how to, to live with intention and be a more mindful consumer. So yeah, it's been, it's been a wonderful journey these past five years. Yeah. And I like how you say that your book is a radical re-envisioning of minimalism that focuses on authenticity over aesthetics. And I can yeah. relate to that a lot just with what I was trying to do with the Minimalist Moms and the Minimalist Moms podcast, that it's not necessarily going to be realistic for a mom of one or many to have a, a sparse bare bones house. I just felt like that was really overwhelming to me. And I like how you say in your book, people make the process much harder than it needs to be. And I think that we, mm -hmm. when we compare it's, it, it feels really daunting and then we don't do anything. We remain stagnant. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, again, I think it goes back to the aesthetics of mainstream mm -hmm. minimalism, right? Which is interesting because, you know, when you have clutter, of course, looking at a photo of a barren space on Pinterest, you're like, oh, that looks so peaceful and serene. I wish I was there. Right. But then mm -hmm. when you mirror it in your own home and you realize like how just not functional it, um, it is for you and your family, it's kind of life altering. And you're like, wait, what am I doing here? So I, on my journey, I have found that the aesthetics, um, and again, the aesthetics of mainstream minimalism, what is shown to us online has mm -hmm. really distracted from the practice. I mean, most minimalists that I know, their version of minimalism, it, everyone's looks different, right? Because mm -hmm. we're all different and unique individuals and what our needs are and what our family's needs are. They all look very different. And so, yeah, I just always like to remind people like authenticity over aesthetic, be your own um, unique self, those things that are important to you, those things that are reflections of what you love. Focus on that less than the aesthetics of mainstream minimalism, um, because it can be daunting, as you said, right? You feel overwhelmed. And then there's like all these unofficial rules online and everyone seems to be doing it right. You're just like, can I have more than a hundred things? Can I have, mm -hmm. you know, it just can be, you know, just too overwhelming. And it does, it leads people to say, you know, I can't do this. I can't be a minimalist. And so I'm always like, you can be a minimalist. You just have to do minimalism your way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I aim to get rid of what's superfluous in my life. And I, I like, I like the idea of spark joy, but I'm also like, not everything sparks joy. Some things are just more intentional that I own. So yeah, I think there's a lot mm -hmm. to be said about just different approaches, but I do think it's defined by what works best for your family. And it doesn't mean you're not a minimalist. If you have more than 30 items in your capsule wardrobe. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, taking little bits and pieces, you know, from everyone's philosophy and your own mm -hmm. philosophy to create you know, it works for you. I mean, I have conmarried my closet, but at the same time, one of her more popular organizing 
I guess, sort of uh, mechanics is her folding method, right? Mm -hmm. I don't fold my clothes, right? I can't, Mm -hmm. I don't have a dresser. I can't have anything with drawers because (laughs) it's just a place for me to hide stuff, right? And so Mm -hmm. some aspects of her minimalist approach work wonderfully for me other aspects don't, you know? And so I take what works for me. Um, and great, I'm super grateful for that. And then, you know, I leave what just doesn't work for me. Right. Again, it's just, Mm -hmm. you know, all of this is the lesson and intention, right. And so you have to be intentional with what you want your wardrobe and your space and your life to look like, and not necessarily be so focused on marrying a certain aesthetic or, you know, Oh, I want my room to look like that. Mm -hmm. No, you want your room to look like what is going to be functional, useful, and authentic to you and your family. Absolutely. And I think that I even try and express this to friends and family members that don't consider themselves minimalists. And honestly, some of them consider themselves more hoarders, but I'm like, I don't want you to feel pressure because that's not what this is about. And I actually want you to succeed in this area. So you have the liberation of minimalism. Like it is so Mm -hmm. liberating. I'm not overwhelmed by things. I don't have a lot to pick up at the end of the day. There are just so many various factors that I have applied minimalism to in my life. And I think that the pressure, again, it just makes people freeze up, but I want to know more about your life. And like you said, you were working a certain profession and then you found minimalism and it really did transform your life. But how did minimalism liberate you? Maybe share some big wins that you felt occurred at that time. Yeah. You know, it's so funny five years into my journey. And I always like to tell people like, so this is a lifelong journey. So there is no like real destination. Like I'm never going to like wake up one morning and say, I am done with the work. You know what I mean? It's like, there's always going to be something to let go and something to, you know, evaluate whether or not I need to welcome it into my life. But for me, I feel like every phase of the journey offers its own benefit. So when I first started my journey, that first round or two of decluttering, you know, some things are much easier to let go of than others. And then what you have left is like, (laughs) I like to call it the good stuff, right? And then, you know, it's a bit harder to make the decisions with the good stuff. And then inevitably some of the good stuff, you know, you reconcile and you're like, I really don't need or use this or love this. And so like, being intentional about paying it forward um, with my donations, like really being the importance of making sure they go towards, you know, serving an individual or a community uh, organization that is in need. So much of it has been like lessons in intention, being intentional with my wardrobe. Oh my goodness. It has saved me mm-hmm. so much time and energy and just headspace especially in the mornings, definitely saw a big win in my wallet, (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? I did a lot of bargain shopping prior to my journey. And so really, you know, getting to understand like, Hey, it's not a deal if you don't need it. Right. Like I did not even realize how much money I was spending on things that I just didn't need. There's just been so many wins, but I think at the end of the day, it's just really, taught me the power of, of tapping into my authenticity and, and the, and the joy that comes with with living with intention. Like that for me has been just the biggest win. And that is like a day, I feel it daily from, from making this decision. And it is just super liberating, right? I don't feel the need to conform to societal pressure to you know, look a certain way or dress a certain way or have certain mm-hmm. things, right? Like it's just very liberating to, to be your authentic self. It's, mm-hmm. it's pretty magical. No, I totally agree. I'm curious how you feel like it's affected your motherhood. Do you feel like it's created a different dynamic with your daughter? And yeah, I'm just curious about that. This is the minimal oh, no. podcast. Yeah, of course. Of course. You know, it's so funny. I, I really wish that it was something that I had pursued or implemented earlier in her childhood. So she's getting ready to graduate from high school now. Mm -hmm. So when I began my journey, she was in middle school, um, always had a very cluttered room, you know, it was always clean your room, clean your, there was just stuff everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was, I wasn't quite on my journey to minimalism just yet at her ninth birthday party, but I mean, it was her eighth birthday party, sorry, but I had just started to feel 
the overwhelm, even though I couldn't name it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we were like, what are we going to get her for her birthday? And I just thought about all these kids coming over with all these more gifts that were good. Oh, I was just like, I can't. (laughs) And we ended up having a birthday party, uh, a carnival in our backyard. We had this huge backyard and we moon bounce. I mean, snow cone, like it was a true carnival. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Her birthday is in July. So it's always a lot of fun for the kids. And instead of having the kids to bring gifts, I asked them to bring one canned good and that we were going to donate it. Yeah, we were going to donate it to our interfaith food pantry. So, you know, the parents are like, oh, this is such a great idea, you know, wonderful kind of thing. And then Mm -hmm. like the night before the party, I started getting all these text messages. (laughs) And the morning of the party, I started getting all these text messages and parents were like, my kid is raiding the pantry. I just want to give you a heads up that we're not just bringing one can. They are insistent that this bag needs to be filled with food to help others. Like the kids went all out. Mm. We ended up having two shopping carts full of food to donate to the Interfaith Food Pantry. And out of all the birthday parties that I had had for her prior to that point, that is the only one that she remembers and loves and celebrate. It was like the best thing for her. You know, she got to meet the mm-hmm. staff at the food pantry. Right. And so, you know, I think for her, that was sort of this catalyst of like, yeah, I really don't need anything else. She was just super content hanging out with her friends. And then, you know, a few years later, when we started our journey and, you know, downsized into 630 square feet, it really showed me she just didn't care about things and wasn't attached to things the way that I thought she was. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, She just wanted to be happy and be in her space and with her few favorite things. Um, And so, you know, I tell moms all the time and parents all the time, we think that our children want certain things or that they're attached to certain things, but they're really not. Um, What they want is our, our love and our time and attention. And, you know, I have moms all the time. They're like, oh my goodness, how can I get my kid to donate some of this? So much stuff. I said, you know, the young people, it's, it's all in the approach because they are naturally compassionate and caring as evidenced by you only need to bring one can, but we're all bringing (laughs) grocery bags. Right. And, you know, instead of, you know, going in there and handing them a donation bag and saying, clean your room right now, it's so much stuff, you know, just say like, hey, you know, there's a lot of kids in our community that aren't as blessed as you to have all of these wonderful things. And are there some things that you'd like to give them? And every time I tell a mom this, they're like, there's no way they're not. And I'm like, okay, just hand them the donation bag, tell them that calmly and close the door and let them make their own decision. And it works every single time. And, you know, I've had moms tell me their kids asked for another bag. I've had moms tell me they just thought their kids were completely selfish and they can't believe that they, you know, they're like, I can't believe this worked. And I'm like, it's not that this worked, it's just all in the approach with young Mm -hmm. people. Right. And so just getting them into the act of not being so attached to their things and, you know, be willing to help others like that's so important. And then also they're so much happier when they have less to care for, you know, oftentimes we like get on them about having clutter as if they went out and purchased all these things for themselves, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. we allowed it into their rooms and into their lives. And I think it was, you know, as much less stressful for her to, to, you know, not have so many things to, to care for and be responsible for. Um, And so, yeah, it's been great. I mean, you know, and living in a small space, it forces you closer, you know, there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide, (laughs) Yeah. you know? Um, And so, yeah, it's been, it's been wonderful for our relationship. And she's, she's an amazing girl and really excited that I was able to instill these values in her before, before she heads out into the world on her own. Yeah. And she can apply it into her own living space. Yeah. I, that's my, that's my hope too, for my kids. I don't want it to backfire on me. So I kind of do some of the same things that you've mentioned, just allowing them to join me and to see the benefits of being empathetic and how it actually makes uh, it. It's like a, it is a good deed, but it does make you feel good too. And that's always a great win-win situation. So I'm glad that you yeah, shared that and story. They get it. It. Yeah, they do. And they get it. I mean, like, you know, the other day, um, 
you know, I made a, a donation to our buy nothing group and mm-hmm. she's like, don't forget my donation. She had already like gone. I didn't even ask uh-huh. her, you know, like yeah. just periodically she'll go through her stuff and it's like, I don't need this. I don't love this anymore. I don't need this. The one caveat though, I tell parents do not look in that bag. If you look in that bag, mm-hmm. your feelings will be so hurt because uh-huh. all the things that you know, you are attached to as part of their childhood, or you thought that they could never do without, you'll be, you'll just be so shocked to see how easily they can give it up when they know Mm. that it's going to help someone who may have nothing. Raising kids who value experiences over stuff requires an investment. I'm talking about an investment into your kids' imaginations, empowering them to expand their horizons anytime, anyplace. Go Kid Go is the audio imagination company for kids. It's created by an Emmy award-winning team. Go Kid Go's newest production, Bobby Wonder, is about a boy with superpowers. Voiced by Danny Pudi, Bobby Wonder will immerse your kids in brain-building adventures each week. Expand your kids' minds without spending money and without any screens. Visit GoKidGo.com or find Bobby Wonder wherever you get your podcasts. In 2021, it's definitely okay to talk about our mental health and happiness. 2020 was interesting, so let's just do a mental health check-in. How are you really, and what do you need right now? Humans are not meant to keep everything inside. It makes us sick, and therapy helps. But what is therapy exactly? It's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help, or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work, not dealing well with stress. Whatever it is that you need, don't be ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what therapy is really about. See if it's for you, because you are your greatest asset. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Minimalist Mom listeners get 10% off the first month at BetterHelp.com slash Minimalist. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Minimalist. In your book, you talk a lot about investing in yourself and your community, and you, you talked about it a little bit here, but I didn't know if you had any other tips about how minimalism can allow us to do this or just any other tips you have in regards to how this can benefit our communities with applying a minimalist, less is liberating mindset. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I feel that, you know, we focus a lot on like collective responsibility for the planet, but we don't really talk about individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. Right. And so Mm -hmm. anyone who chooses to only consume what they need is naturally benefiting not only their own life, but also um, the planet, but then also just like thinking through just the many different ways that the things that no longer serve you can serve others, which is why I'm a big fan of buy nothing groups, right? I mean, a big fan of being um, super intentional with your donations instead of just dropping them off at what I like to call the usual suspects, like Goodwill and Salvation Army, right? Like Mm -hmm. intentionality should be at the root of everything, right? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, yes, donating, you know, a bag of something to Goodwill gets it out of your house, but is it burdening this organization? Um, Mm -hmm. Is it stuff that they don't need? Is it stuff that they're going to put in a landfill because they just, it's not what they need. Right. Um, So Mm -hmm. I really encourage people to look at not only their local buy nothing groups, but community organizations, right. It just requires, again, just like this extra little step of due diligence. You know, people say, I don't know what to do with my kitchen mm-hmm. appliances, right? And it's just like, did you check the EPA? They have an appliance disposable program, you know? Mm-hmm. Did you check to see if there are any food justice organizations in your community who would love to have an extra blender, right? You, So many of your things can go directly to servicing people in need rather than what is really called wish cycling when you, when you give it to organizations, you're just kind of like wishing and hoping that someone needs it, right? Like why do that when you can be intentional? And so, yeah, like those are some of the ways I think that 
what no longer serves us can really go towards serving others in need, right? Mm-hmm. In our right in our own backyard, you know? Absolutely. And I think that it honestly can be as easy as writing on Facebook, hey, does anyone know where I donate? Fill in the blank. And people are happy to give you advice on where they can donate. Oh, and I think too goodness. thinking outside of the box in the way yeah. that you said, being more intentional than opposed to going to Goodwill. And yeah. Uh, yeah. There's nothing I guess wrong with Goodwill, but it, again, it's like, is it burdening them? Well, it is. I don't I know. Mean, yeah. like they recently, recently, there was an article that I read recently, which is why I really, um, I recently posted about buy nothing groups, you know, mm-hmm. and there's a Goodwill donation center is just saying like, please, we don't want your trash, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, please stop. Right. And again, when you look at a lot of these organizations, their websites, they'll tell you, what they take. what they need mm-hmm. and 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 that changes daily with the pandemic there were certain things that goodwill could no longer take but if you mm-hmm. didn't do your due diligence you donated them right mm-hmm. and what are they supposed mm-hmm. to do with it all it's going to end it's still going to end up in the trash right and so i always feel mm-hmm. like thinking about where is this most likely to mm-hmm. end up and you know there are animal shelters that We'll take your old towels and linen. Yes. But like, there's so many different things in in, in organizations in your community, um, and I really encourage people, especially folks who really struggle with attachment and letting go of certain things. You know, it's much easier when you find um, an organization that aligns with a mission or something that you believe in mm-hmm. to let it go. You mm-hmm. know, so it may be harder to let go of a designer suit because again people even though they're ready to let it go they still have an attachment to Mm -hmm. it and so they'll say like oh I don't want I don't want someone who doesn't need the suit to get this suit you know it's just Mm -hmm. and and again that's like this whole other layer (laughs) of the psychology of ownership but like getting people to understand that, hey, if I know this suit is going to dress for success or some other organization that is really going to benefit a woman in the midst of her life transition, that really align with causes and missions that you believe in. And it really helps with that attachment piece and breaking that attachment. A hundred percent. Well, this was great. Uh, I want to wrap up with our last final two questions, but before we do that, I'll allow you to tell listeners where they can find you and find a copy of your new book. Sure. So my new book is called The Afro-Minimalist Guide to Living with Less. And you can find me, I'm on all uh, social media, but I'm most active on Instagram. I have a wonderful community there. Um, And so really encourage people to go there and follow me that way. And my handle is at Afro Minimalist. Um, I also have a column uh, with Food 52 called Simply Living. um, And that's a new column. And so we're building community there as well. And uh, the Afro Minimalist Guide is available wherever books are sold. And um, I really hope it encourages people to, you know, look at minimalism through a new lens and really, you know, just become more emboldened and confident to define it for themselves and create a, create a minimalist practice that works Mm -hmm. best for them. Yes, absolutely. Well, you've encouraged me in this episode. Like I said, you've said a few (laughs) things that I've never heard. So I'm excited about that, but I have two questions that I usually ask every guest, but I felt like I've been doing the same ones for two years now. So I'm mixing it up with you. You are my first one. I'm going to ask these two new questions too. And the first one is what is something that is dear to you that you could never minimize? (sighs) Ah, This is tough um, because I've really started to embrace this whole loving and letting go philosophy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I never want to become so attached to anything like that. But I would say books and plants, I'm not really trying to minimize (laughs) (laughs) those areas of my life. If I have to let go, I'm sure, um, you know, I'm sure I'd be able to whittle it down. Um, But Mm -hmm. thankfully, that's not a... (laughs) that's not something that I have to do right now, but yeah, books, books and plants to me are just essential parts of my life. I hear that. My next question was going to be, what is an area that you struggle to keep minimal for me? It's books and coffee. So I feel like that we're aligned. <laughs> we're aligned there. Yeah. I mean, I actually struggled with toiletries. Like that was, you know, oh, yeah. my, my biggest area of consumption was my wardrobe and toiletries, the number of health and beauty products that I had, it was obscene, right? Like I would 
find multiple bottles. I would find mm-hmm. things that had expired. I, you know, I just had to put myself on a moratorium, but um, yeah, that was a big, that was a big struggle for me yeah. early on. I think so much of the skincare and I guess wellness for your body is trial and error. So I feel like I finally found the things that I need so I can get rid of everything else. Cause I'm like, okay, this seems to be working. <laughs> I like it. We're going to be on this path. <laughs> I know it's so tempting though, right? Anything yeah. that's promising to make you feel better and look better. Um, yeah. Yeah. When I still, you know, when I have those moments of weakness, I usually just allow myself to get like a trial size of something. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so like, I still get to experience it. I still get to decide, you know, if it's something you know, that I want to get in full size. Um, Mm -hmm. And then usually you're left with like a really wonderful reusable container. So either way, it's a win-win with the trial. (laughs) No, I love that. (laughs) Yeah. That's good for like carry-ons for flights and such. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Well, Christine, this was wonderful. I am so excited to have had the opportunity to talk to you and discuss this new book. So I just appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much. It was so wonderful. And, you know, I hope this conversation really helps some of the mamas um, understand, number one, that they're not alone. And number two, that, you know, it is possible. Again, it's just being more intentional about not only what you allow into your own life, but also into the lives of your children, you know, just teaching them what to value and, and, and what to hold dear and teaching them to love and let go, right? It's, these are all just lessons and intentions. So, I hope they find it helpful. What did you think of the episode? It's funny because right after I got off the phone call with Christine, I told my husband that she said something that really stood out to me. And that was, we find ourselves really frustrated with the clutter in our children's room, but it's not as though they had the money to go out and bring it all home and to buy those things. And that was really convicting to me. I would say that Charlotte mostly brings home things from my parents' house that were my childhood things. But other than that, when I do get frustrated, it's like, well, I'm the grown up here and shouldn't I help navigate this area? So I don't know. That really stood out to me. I think, like I said in the episode, there were many things that Christine said that I hadn't really contemplated before. So I really appreciated her joining me here today. What were your thoughts? I'd love to know. I invite you to keep the conversation going at minimalistmomspodcast.com. There you'll find links to the Instagram account, Facebook page, and where you can find me all around the web. Thank you for joining up on this journey. I wish you a lovely week as you think more and do with less.